All right, welcome everybody. Darren and I are so excited to go over some OCT interpretation with you today. Um, since I've started as an optometrist, OCT has really become a day-to-day, -day, you know, I cannot live without my OCT. And I think there's so much use in going through and trying to figure out how to really interpret. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Gould. I'm the Chief of Advanced Care Services at SUNY College of Optometry. Um, I run the disease clinics there, see patients in our retina, glaucoma, dry eye, and cataract services. So I see a lot of different pathology, and I'm excited to share some of those with you today. And just by way of introduction, I've uh, been an ophthalmic photographer for about 30 years now, and I run a consulting business where I work with all facets of ophthalmology in uh, education. And I also work in a clinic as well, so I get to see this uh, in real time and real patients. That's great. So we are going to start and go through from the front of the eye to the back of the eye today and really give you a sense of how we look at patients, um, some imaging techniques, some guidance to try and help better manage your patients. So our first case is um, that we're going to discuss is going to be of evaluating narrow angles in patients. Um, I think that, you know, gonioscopy is obviously the gold standard. It's something that we must do. But I think that in the back of our, you know, in our toolbox, we also have our OCTs that we can utilize. So in this case, patient case that I have here, um, I work very closely with an ophthalmologist who does LPIs with us. Um, so we see a lot of narrow angle patients. And I love this angle to angle image where we can actually see the entire anterior chamber at one time. Um, what's great about this is it actually will not only allow you to visualize the angle as we see it, and in this case, we can see that the temporal angle is a little bit wider than our nasal angle, but we also can visualize the actual depth or uh, air area of the anterior chamber. And so we will do these on patients, especially if we're not quite convinced that an LPI is needed, we'll monitor with the OCT, and you can have that value to monitor over time and see if we actually have a change. So this patient was in clinic with me last week. We redid the OCT, and you can see that we actually have a fairly significant, a one millimeter square change in the area over that one year of time. The other thing that I think is really interesting is when we're trying to decide if an LPI is indicated for a patient, we need our gonioscopy findings. We need some sort of elevation in IOP. We need some you know, pigment smudging or, or evidence of PAS but we can also look really closely for any evidence of irritabotrabecular contact. And we can actually see that here on the patient's um, nasal angle in our exam last week. And so I think that was really important. So we went from saying, okay, we can monitor this patient. The angles look narrow. Um, you know, normally an LPI would be indicated if an if angle is less than 10 degrees, um, which we can definitely, you know, this nasal angle is, but we, we, we really kind of were holding off a little bit. And then we've come a year later, we have that narrowing of the anterior chamber and really felt like it was indicated. Another point that I always like to make with my patients with narrow angles is it's really, really, really important to grab a nerve fiber layer and a ganglion cell analysis on them. Um, with this patient, this is the same patient that we looked at, when we actually run the nerve fiber layer, we can see that we have a big asymmetry between the right and the left overall average nerve fiber layer thickness. When we look at the thickness plots, you can actually visualize that there's a lot of superior nerve fiber layer thinning. And so we've actually gone from say, you know, having this patient as a narrow angle suspect to proving that she has nerve fiber layer damage. We can also see that affiliated damage in the ganglion cell analysis. So this patient now, instead of just being a suspect for narrow angles, has gone into having further narrowing of the angles and has now become a chronic angle closure glaucoma patient. So I think that that was a really important, you know, we started running the nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell analysis on all of our patients pretty recently um, before doing LPIs. And I think that was a big kind of, it, 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 we'd be surprised on how many of these very subtle uh, defects you find when you start running those evaluations. Jennifer, can I ask you a couple of quick questions on, on the technique on this? Um, sure. You, you, uh, of course, you would standardize your scan, so the light in the room would be standardized from visit to visit. Is that correct? That's, yes, I definitely. I think that's an important thing to sort of key in on, yep. um, especially if you're if you're scanning them in a brightly lit room and then you turn the lights out and see what happens to their angle when, when their eye dilates. Yeah, we actually sometimes will uh, do images in both um, if that's when the ophthalmologist will actually recommend that we do that. Um, but we typically have the room very, very dimly lit um, so that we're getting that full iris kind of smushing into the angle. Um, but I think it is really, it's a dynamic process. So I think the lighting is really important to consider when you're when you're taking those images. 
And, and do you typically use the angle measuring tool that you, you're illustrating here? Yeah, so the top right, you can see that we have the angle measurement tool in. Um, we don't actually typically put it in because as you can see, it's very, very difficult to get it to follow along with the anatomy. So it follows along kind of the, the corneal and the trabecular meshwork really nice, but it really doesn't follow along the angle, uh, the iris very well. So it's not something that I actually put in, but it is a tool that if you feel that it would be helpful, um, I know some providers like to use it. I kind of more go with just an eyeball. Um, what about the, the doctors in your practice? Pretty much the same thing. I think they find it distracting. You know, to, they can sort of eyeball, like you say, and, and figure out what the angle might be rather than trying to measure it with this and then calling that a definitive number when really they feel that it's not really an accurate measurement of it because it's so linear. So as you said, it doesn't follow the anatomical structure. All right. Other uses of our anterior segment OCT, um, we can also evaluate and monitor patients who have pigment dispersion. This is a really nice image of the um, bowing back of the iris and pigment dispersion. Um, one thing I will draw your attention to is look at the, the vast difference in the anterior chamber uh, depth when we actually evaluate our uh, versus our patient with narrow angles. We see that that anterior chamber is so much larger in our patients with pigment dispersion. So kind of get used to looking at those numbers there. Um, and another patient that I thought was really interesting that, would, that I've really been using this um, anterior segment technology on is for iris cysts. So this is a, this is a young lady who's been coming into me. Uh, this is the UBM of her iris cyst, and you can see it really, really nicely on there. But when we image the patient, we can actually see that we have, we can see the cyst really, really nicely on the anterior segment OCT. Um, and so we've been repeating this frequently to make sure that it's not changing in size. And so it's been, it's been very, very helpful to have the, you know, the, the ease of use of an anterior segment OCT or so much more than a UBM. And this, the patient's 12 years old, you know, getting a UBM and the contact on the eye, it's, it's very, actually very difficult. I'm surprised we got the quality of image that we did up here. Um, so the OCT is obviously a much less invasive way to image the same patient. Yeah, and I think if you, if you certainly if you're in a practice where you have somebody else doing your imaging rather than yourself, I think it's really important that they, the communication is there and, and they get you exactly what you're looking for. I uh, go into a lot of practices and, and there's a breakdown in communication and they'll scan what they think they need. Then the patient leaves or whatever and the physician or the, you know, looks at it and says, that's not exactly what I was looking for. Um, and the other nice thing is you can obviously do multiple scans. You don't have to just do a single line scan and call it good. Um, oh, yeah. Especially if you're not entirely sure what you're looking for, you can sort of just scan the, the, the vast area and, and, and get it in there. Yeah, definitely. And you can see in this top right image too, you can see that we actually moved the line scan on an angle to make sure that we were able to get through that lesion that we were trying to image. Very helpful. So um, I'm going to jump in and just go over this case real quick. So this is a case of um, ocular surface squamous neoplasia. Um, and it's interesting because we, I, I practice in Maine, our practice is on the coast of Maine, and we actually see a lot of these. Uh, we, we probably see one a month uh, in our practice, so it's, it's pretty common, uh, which is kind of strange. Uh, but, but when we're scanning these patients, OC, the anterior segment OCT was ice is the perfect tool for this because I can take a nice slant photograph of it, but you really can't, without being in stereo, you really can't get the depth of it. You can't really see how thick that, uh, that epi conjunctival epithelium is. But with the OCT, it, you, you can really see this well. And if you, I'll go to this next slide, you can see that the key features you're really looking for in OSSN is the clear delineation between normal uh, epithelium and then abnormal hyperreflective thickened epithelium. There's a real clear cutoff delineation. Of this is where it starts, and then it just gets thick throughout there. Um, and you can see it's because it's so thick, it's very hyperreflective as well. So it jumps right out at you. But the technique in getting this is much like what we just talked about with, um, with, with doing scans of, of cysts and that sort of thing. This is a very large area to scan. You know, if we're doing a two millimeter slice of this, you know, we want to make sure we get the best image we possibly can. So frequently, I will actually do uh, sort of raster scans through the entire lesion from the top to the bottom. And then the clinician can look at it and scroll through and actually look at the different images and see which one actually sort of uh, uh, solidifies the diagnosis, if you will. Um, yeah, and Jennifer, great. we were talking um, that that you don't really see a lot of this in your area. Uh, yeah, I've actually never seen an OSSN patient, so I was really excited to see these images when Darren put them in. Um, you know, the one thing that it actually almost reminded me of a little bit when I started to look at the OCT images is actually your limbal stem cell deficiency patients mm -hmm. end up with a very similar um, presentation of that hyper-reflectiveness, what we're seeing um, 
up here, oops, sorry, that we're seeing here, they end up with that on the cornea when they have advanced limbal stem cell deficiency. So that kind of just popped into my head as, hey, that kind of looks similar. So now I know in the future, if I see that, I know exactly what I'm looking at. And it's interesting when they describe these and they say, you know, the, the difference between OSSN and some other sort of neoplasia, not neoplasia, but some sort of other uh, tumor or even pinguiculum in that, the, mm -hmm. the levels of hyperreflectivity or thickening is kind of almost comical. They say it's severely hyperreflective and thick in OSSN and moderate to severe in something else. So it's very subjective, it seems like, but it's that mm -hmm. real clear delineation that goes normal and then suddenly abnormal that really kind of uh, keys it in, I think. Yeah, those are really great images. So this is actually one of my favorite patients that I've been seeing recently. Um, she presented into the clinic and we looked at her cornea and we're like, we have no idea what this is. Um, so the patient has limbal, uh, uh, lipid keratopathy from a previous herpetic infection. Um, and so what we can see on the images is you can see all of the lipid deposition that's coming from the neovascularization around the periphery. Um, treatment for this is Avastin injections and actually an argon laser. So really kind of crazy. You know, wh who, who would think you're going to have an Avastin injection for a corneal problem? It just seems kind of insane. Um, but this, I thought these images were really beautiful. So we were following her for a while. Everything was okay. And she developed a neurotrophic ulcer, um, which makes sense when we have a herpetic disease. Obviously, the cornea has um, doesn't have the same feeling and so that we can actually get these ulcers. But what we ended up doing is we monitored the patient for a really long time and you know, we, we were monitoring actually with our pachymetry readings because we were able to get a really good visualization of the size of the lesion and monitor that size of the lesion over time. So really, I thought that was a really creative use of the OCT. Um, what I also really like about this is when we grab the really high definition corneal scans, we can actually visualize the amount of excavation of the epithelium and the stroma. You know, I was really concerned with this patient that we were going to end up with stromal melting. And so these images were really helpful for me to look at her on a day-to-day -day basis and say, okay, we, we've improved. We have a little bit of improvement. We're getting better. Um, oh, we're getting worse today. And, you know, obviously kind of determine how we're managing and what we were doing there. So I think really, you know, creative use of the, of imaging. Um, one of the other things that we can do is you can actually use a caliper tool and you can measure the cornea. Um, I do like to depend on the measurement from the pachymetry reading a little bit more than my handheld um, measurements there, but it is something that we can throw in and, and just another tool in your bag of tricks when we're taking a look at patients. So another use of the anterior segment OCT in herpetic disease as well is actually if patients have stromal keratitis. Um, so this top image is a patient with an active stromal keratitis, and you can see the hyperreflectivity of the anterior stroma. Um, patient was treated with antivirals and steroids. And you can see that that resolved over time. And so I thought, you know, another really nice use case, um, you know, sometimes, especially when the cornea is so hazy, um, in these cases, when he, he has definitely a scar from his old herpetic lesion, it's difficult to tell if we actually have that full resolution. And so being able to look for that hyperreflectiveness and then the absence of the hyperreflectiveness over time is very useful. But again, as we've kind of already mentioned, it's really important to make sure that we have uh, that education and discussion with the imaging staff, because if we would image this lesion through different areas, we're going to be evaluating something different over time. So really kind of getting a good documentation of where you're imaging is going to be really important. Yeah, I don't think we can stress that enough. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I really run into is that the, the image is really, uh, like for instance, in the practice I work with, we, I, I see mostly retina patients. Uh, and so when we do anterior, anterior scans or anterior imaging, I'm constantly going to the physician and saying, what are you looking for? W what should I be looking for? Um, what do you want to see? So that I kind of get a, a better idea of what, and then once we, we, like with OSSN, for instance, once we get those images, I have them sit down and explain to me, what exactly, what are you seeing here? And, you know, what should I have done better? Or what, uh, or what did I do well that you were able to make this diagnosis from? So I think that's really key that they're, they're a big part of that, uh, that, that uh, caring for the patient for sure. Yeah, I definitely agree. Okay, so in keeping with our theme of front to back of the eye, let's talk about the posterior segment. So this is really my wheelhouse, as I mentioned. This is where I spend most of my time uh, is in the back of the eye. Um, the first thing I'm gonna talk about, we'll talk about macular degeneration and do a, a sort of a normal progression from dry to wet AMD. And these are examples of different uh, 
different uh, findings in dry AMD. So the top left image you see here is a patient who just has sort of some elevation of the RPE, but you'll notice obviously there's some graying under the RPE. So there's no fluid there. This is not an RPE detachment per se. They've got some very large drusen that actually are living underneath here. They have some atrophy on the side here as well. Um, but down below, this is kind of an interesting case. I, this is actually from today. I scanned this patient. And I was thinking, I really need to find a patient with hard drusen to really illustrate the difference between hard and soft drusen on OCT. And it's really kind of cool because this patient has hard drusen. And it's very easy to identify because hard drusen has this sort of peak to it, has sort of a, a this triangular shape where soft drusen are rounded. So it's really easy to differentiate between the two. A lot of the patients that we see with advanced dry AMD, especially in geographic atrophy or sort of end stage uh, AMD, we get a lot of these little circular um, findings in here. And this, you'll notice this is, if you could orient yourself here, this is Brooks membrane RPE down here. Photoreceptor cell layer should be right up in here. And then the external limiting membrane kind of goes around this circular um, uh, finding here. And this is actually outer retinal tubulation or ORT. And this is actually the photoreceptor cell layer that's sort of wrapped up and sort of curled up into sort of the circular ball round circle here. And we see a lot of these in conjunction with intraretinal or subretinal fluid, which is easy to distinguish because that doesn't have this sort of bright white reflectivity around it, which is that photoreceptor cell layer. Um, so we see a lot of AMD in my practice I work with, and it never fails when I get somebody who has advanced dry AMD, I'm more than likely going to find one of these. It's like finding a mushroom um, when you find these sometimes. I think that's great. Darren, do you ever use the advanced RPE analysis um, on the OCT? We, we typically don't. We, you know, we're, we're a private practice and we see in retina, the three retina doctors, we see about 130 patients a day or so. And every single one of those come through imaging. Every single one of them get an OCT at the very least. A lot of them get angiography and OCT angiography as well. Um, so we don't really spend a lot of time on that. We're more of, um, our clinicians are more of a, a, a visual looking at a line scan kind of a practice, if you will. Uh, okay. They're not really hung up on volumetric measurements and that sort of thing. They really want to see the pathology is what they want to do. Okay, yeah. Just so if everyone understands, the advanced RP analysis does, it gives you measurements of the amount of drusen within a three and five millimeter circle. And then it also will map out any geographic atrophy and give you a measurement of that over time. Um, and I definitely, I don't use it on all of my AMD patients, but I definitely have some like very type A patients and they want to know, like, did I change? Did it get worse? Um, and I think that that's really helpful. It's a nice visual for the patients to show stability or progression. So I think it's, it's a nice little trick to have in your, your tool bag. Sure. So then moving on to, um, to our exudative wet macular degeneration. So the top image here is kind of a classic, what we typically see. Obviously, there's a lot, lots to unpack in this one image. They've got a lot going on with vitro macular traction going on, intraretinal fluid, uh, RP detachment, um, and uh, so there's a lot, a lot of uh, issues with this patient. So in our practice, we actually, um, if I see a patient that comes in that presents on OCT with an RPE detachment and they're being referred for wet macular degeneration, I immediately do an OCT angiogram with the angioplex, and it's our go-to tool for this. And what it, what's nice about this is clearly there's something going on here. When I do an OCTA, I can see this neovascular complex. I don't need to do a fluorescein angiogram or an ICG angiogram because frankly, this gives me more information than those two will. So we, we tend to do those uh, hand in hand. We'll do an OCT lines, uh, volumetric line scan, and then we'll do an OCT angiogram if we feel there's something that needs to be found there uh, or look for something. And we do that with dry AMD as well because we have this um, large population of non-exudative cordial neovascularization. So they have you know, what look like dry AMD, drusen, um, nothing really going on, even on dye angiography, but OCT angiography will show a, a large neovascular complex that just isn't leaking. Um, so those are people we keep a close watch on as well. Uh, this is sort of our bread and butter in, in the retina practice I work with. Um, and the bottom image is a little bit of a different animal. This probably should have gone on our zebra cases, but this is a patient that was referred for wet AMD. And clearly you can see they have an RPE uh, detachment here. Um, you can see intraretinal fluid and some subretinal fluid over here, a lot of subretinal fluid. On OCT, on uh, fluorescein angiography, we uh, you can actually see these little round white dots in these circles. This patient actually has polyporto so PCV. 
And it's interesting because we don't see a lot of it in the Northeast. Um, I know it's a, it tends to be more common in Asian population. And I think West Coast, they see quite a bit of this. Um, I don't know about your experience, Jennifer, if you're seeing a lot on. on yeah, we actually see a decent amount of it as well, which I think is, you know, it is kind of shocking. Um, but I think, you know, especially in the African American population, if you do see something that looks like AMD, often it's actually a polypoidal as well. So it is highly prevalent there. Um, I, what I really like about the OCT image there is you can see that that drusenoid detachment um, really, or that pigment epithelial detachment really has like a 90 degree turn to it. And that's really right. pathognomonic for the polypoidal. Right. And anecdotally too, it seems like we always seem to find these right outside the optic nerve head. You know, they mm -hmm. seem to linger parapapillary. You know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. whenever I see somebody that has fluid parapapillary in their wet A and B, the first thing I think of is it's probably going to be PCV, and uh, mm -hmm. and and most of the time it tends to be. So. Yeah, very nice images. Thank you. So here's another case that this patient was actually referred for central serous retinopathy, and you can see on the OCT there is some subretinal fluid, but there is a little bit of uh, elevation of the RPE as well, which um, the scan that was actually sent with the patient didn't show that. The scan was actually just off a little bit from this scan. It wasn't straight through the fovea. It was actually a little bit decentered, and it just had subretinal fluid. Um, so one of the things we're going to talk about shortly is central serous retinopathy. And one of the key things you look for is choroidal thickening, which you don't tend to see in patients who have uh, exudated AMD. Um, this patient probably did have CSR at one point because you can see there's sort of the staining on the fluorescein up in this area, a little bit here. But this has more hyperreflectivity to it. And on ICG, you can actually see these little branches of the neovascular complex. And of course, our OCT angiogram seals it right there. Uh, definitely see this sort of large feeder vessel that feeds into this neovascular complex here. So it was a little bit, um, because also the other factor was this patient was like early to mid 50s. So that was sort of another thing. Well, boy, it's kind of on the fence. You know, this could be CSR, but but you'll notice that the choroidal thickness really stays the same throughout here. It's a little bit, made, I mean, subjectively, you could say it might be a little thick here, but it's really not obviously so. Uh, but again, this is another thing we see quite a bit of as well. Yeah, I think that's a really great case because by having that angiography in such an easy test, you really change the treatment for a patient. Instead of, you know, monitoring this patient or, or you know, prescribing them spironolactone, We've now moved into patient really needs uh, intravitreal anti-VEGF agents to treat that neovascularization. So I think it's really right. cool how the OCT can change your management. And OCT angiography has completely changed our practice. It completely changed it. I mean, we're 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 utilizing it, uh, you know, as, as a workhorse at this point. Uh, yeah, I definitely it's, agree. Yeah, especially through COVID nineteen. Well, that too. Yeah, that's true. Um, here's another interesting case, too. So this patient, this is a very strange uh, presentation. Uh, obviously, we kind of gave it away with the OCT angiogram here, the choriocapillaris, uh, I'm sorry, the avascular zone. You can see there's clearly a neovascular complex here, which is probably represented in here. But it's just an interesting finding because this wasn't, I had to really sort of scan through to find this little area that almost looks like a circular void here, if you will. And you can see, obviously, the RPE is elevated. External limiting membrane kind of disappears into this mess here. So, you know, it's nice when you see these patients that it's very clear. Here's RPE. Here's Brooks membrane. Here's the external limiting membrane. This is where. But when a lot of the times we get these patients, everything just sort of, it's like a car crash. They all sort of jam in together and you can't really pick those apart. You know, with the morphology of this disease just kind of melds a lot of those layers together. So it's hard to pick that out. And this is a clear example of something like that. Um, but you can see Brooks membrane is clearly disrupted down in here. Mm -hmm. And that's probably where this neovascular complex is coming through. Yeah. Okay. All right. So every week we have someone come into the clinic and they're complaining of flashes of light, new floaters. And, you know, my favorite thing to do is actually to run an OCT on these patients because, you know, obviously we do our clinical exam and we're looking for, you know, PBD is going to be your number one differential. So we obviously are examining for that, but I can't tell you how many times I get to the end of the exam and I'm like, I don't see a PBD. And then I'm not comfortable because the patient still has flashes. And so this is an example of a patient exactly that I have flashes. I don't see anything on my clinical. So we throw her in the OCT. And when we look at the OCT, you can actually see that she was detached over the macula. So she had a, a partial vitreous detachment, 
But what's really important in these cases is to go to the nerve. We know that the the most the area where the vitreous is the has the thickest adhesion is at the optic nerve head. And so run over to the optic nerve, take scans there. I like to actually either use the uh, scans vertical and horizontal like you see here, or actually the radial raster scan is probably one of my favorite things to use right now. This was a couple of years ago before we had that option. Um, and you can see that we actually, you know, the vitreous is partially detached, but it is partially attached as well. So this is the horizontal scan. And then the vertical scan, we can actually see on the temporal side of the optic nerve head, um, we have complete uh, adhesion here on the nasal side of the optic nerve head where we are actually completely adhesed. And on the nasal side, we're actually detached. So it's really a nice interpretation or really, we can kind of see why the patient has flashes now because we have this adhesion there. So in this case, you know, obviously when we follow patients like this, we're going to see them, you know, fairly soon after. I'm going to see her even sooner because I want to make sure we don't miss anything and we don't have any re peripheral retinal tears. Um, so in this case, I saw the patient back in three weeks and the flashes had resolved and we redid the OCT. And you can see here that area that was completely attached down on the bottom left has now detached. And so this was a really good confirmation to me too that that adhesion had let up. So I think it's a really good use case of something very simple, something we see all the time and really utilizing your OCT to make you feel more comfortable as a clinician. So another um, area that we could discuss and, and go into with our vitreoretinal retinal disease is going to be your full thickness macular holes. Um, so we'll kind of remember the pathophysiology of this. It really is related to just, you know, PVD as we've just been discussing. Um, but this is a patient who had very minor, if you look very, very closely, very minor vitreomacular adhesion at this exam. She came back about three months later and had a full thickness macular hole. Um, and, you know, it was, it was very nice, especially from an educational perspective, to run through the pathophysiology that, yes, we typically will get a full thickness macular hole after that, that adhesion kind of pulls on the retina, it we, we leads to the hole. So I think it was, it was really nice sequelae, and then the patient ended up having surgery and has resolved afterwards. Um, one of the things when we're taking a look at retinal OCTs, I think it's always nice to try and predict a patient's VA afterwards. And really to do that, you want to pay attention to the outer retina because that's really obviously where the photoreceptors are and that's where the money comes. And so looking at the four bright bands, looking at Brooks membrane, looking at the RP, looking at the uh, the, IP, the PIL is what we call it, it's in the ellipsoid zone um, and the, the outer, uh, external limiting membrane are there, excuse me the outer retina. Look at the outer retina. Um, when we see that, we can actually see that there's this little kind of hole. It almost mimics like a solar retinopathy at this point, um, but that's obviously just uh, still a defect from the repair. So, you know, this there's a little defect here, but really the outer retina looks pretty much intact and pretty good. A little bit of a ratty PIL off to the side right below this edema. Um, and so I always love to kind of predict. And in this case, the patient's vision is actually 20-25 in the size. So I think it's really awesome to be able to really look at the retina and say, yeah, the outer retina looks pretty good. I do expect to get acuity after. Um, and I think what's also really important is to understand the size of macular holes. So when we're looking at the size, um, there was a the group came out a couple of years ago that went through resizing and, and kind of depending on uh, your referrals. So holes are based on if it's under 250 microns, that would be considered a small hole and anything over 400 microns would be considered a large hole. Well, our small holes will have better acuity and are more likely to close, but our large holes are not. So in this case, when you measure the hole, we always want to use, you use your calipers because there's not a there's not an actual way to, the OCT does not measure it automatically, but you want to measure this, the smallest part of the hole that you can have. And so in this case, we have a 422 micron hole. And I think that was really important saying, okay, we have a big hole. We want to get this over to the ophthalmologist right away for surgical repair. I think this is a great example too. Of what we were discussing earlier about making sure that there's communication with the imagers because this, uh, the image you have on the far right, the post-op image is an excellent image because you, you're able to see that defect in the outer retina, but it's a very small defect. And if, if your imager wasn't looking for that, they could easily miss that and you wouldn't get the information you needed to, to be able to sort of predict that. Um, and, and looking, you know, I've seen a lot of post-ops that look perfectly fine. There's no outer retinal uh, uh, destruction left after or anything. But as soon as you move the scan slightly, you start picking up a little bit of that. So um, so it, I think it's really, really key, that communication, again, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Mm 
Yeah. And this is actually the top presentation is in forum, um, which I couldn't live without in my retina practice. I think it's really important. Um, one of the nice things is that it will match the images and you can synchronize the movement. So I can scroll through all of the images at the same time and look for very subtle changes over time. And so luckily this is completely matched right at the center of the fovea. So, you know, I'm able to get the image that I want, but I think it is really important if you're managing a lot of retina patients to either, you know, have an imaging viewing software or to actually go sit at the OCT and scroll through the images too. Um, in, in cases like this, when we're trying to look for exact, you know, this is really helpful to me in predicting her visual acuity. Um, the bottom right hand image is another thing that I find really interesting on the um, software. This is the minimum intensity projections. And so the minimum intensity projection scan will actually show you anywhere that there's a cavitation within the retina. So if this is the same, this image down here on the right is the same day that we did the image in the middle. And so you can see all of these little cystic spaces. And if we look at the image down here, all of the dark areas are corresponding to those cysts. And what I think is just so cool about this is you can actually like see Henley's layer and you can see how the edema has developed right around that hole. So it's a really nice way. In this case, we can obviously see the edema very easily on our just regular OCT scan. But in cases of diabetes or other diseases where we have very subtle um, little cavitations within the retina, I find that uh, minimum intensity projection really, really helpful for evaluating the patients. And then this is just another case of our vitreo retinal disease, looking at your retinal membranes over time. Um, it was really funny. I was telling one of my patients a couple of weeks ago that I, I see a lot of epiretinal retinal membranes as we all do, but I've never actually seen one change. Like they've always just, they, they are what they are and they stay stable. And then this patient walked into the clinic last week and I was like, I found one that changed. And so another really nice uh, representation in forum. So we can see this image on the left was three years ago, uh, no evidence of an epiretinal membrane. And we can see that the membrane kind of started to develop over time. What I really like about these is looking at the color maps because it gives you a sense of how big the membrane is. It kind of lets you visualize it a little bit more over time. What's also helpful Helpful, though, is when you have the measurements um, from the macular cube, you can see the thickness and we can actually see that the central thickness increased significantly over our three-year mark since we were monitoring the patient. So really easy way to look at that. I think you have to look at it topographically as well. Like you were saying, to see the size of this, you can't see how big this really is or, or, or it, you know, just with a single line scan like that, you really have to look at it on the surface. Yeah, well, and then the other thing is, what I you know I teach the students about you know evaluating after membranes and looking for them. They're so hard to see clinically sometimes, and so we actually can use you can't even photograph them. So it's easier when we use the OCT because it's going to make it pop. So this is the on-fos view of the vitreoretinal retinal interface, and when we start to look at that on-fos view, you can actually see all of the wrinkling that's within the retina all around. And so this is really easy just to take a couple seconds and get you know to really be able to understand the size of this your retinal membrane. For if I took a color photo of this, the patient would look, you know, pretty normal. Um, might see a little bit of vascular tortuosity, but the OCT really makes it apparent at the changes that have happened to the retinal surface. And then just a couple other fun uh, vitreo retinal interface issues. Um, lamellar holes are also very related to our full thickness vascular hole. Um, so just from an etiology standpoint, when the uh, PVD occurs, it kind of, you know, it's, it's on its way to being a full thickness macular hole and the process is aborted. And so what you end up with is just an abnormal um, inner retinal surface. And so in this case, you could almost, you know, it looks like a chunk was eaten out of the retina. Um, so you, know, you see this little teeny tiny chunk down here. Um, it, they vary in presentation. So sometimes you'll see a little bit of a schesis within the retina. Sometimes you'll have some cystic spaces, but you know, again, we talked about looking at the outer retina and looking at those four bright bands. We shouldn't have any change in vision from a lamellar hole because we really have the outer retina fully intact. So it's really a nice kind of, it's something to monitor, but we don't expect change over time and we don't affect, uh, expect it to be visually significant. And I think it's great that you also, you highlighted that the, the posterior hyaluron is not attached in the same mm -hmm. image. So you get the mm -hmm. whole story in one image there, which mm -hmm. is great. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and then the other thing that I always love seeing, and it's very, and it's not very common, but it's myopic macular schesis, which is definitely related to our vitreoretinal conditions. 
So in our DGEN biops with the increased axial length, um, often you'll end up having kind of a full pulling, a diffuse pulling of the um, retina and you end up with the schesis there. So this patient actually had a lot of subretinal fluid because they had either subretinal um, detachment because of the amount of pulling that they had. And so we monitor very closely. In this case, if we needed to treat this, if the patient had progressive changes in vision, you know, vitrectomy would be indicated, but we've been monitoring the patient for a long time and they've looked like this over time. Um, clinically, when I look at these patients, I think it's always crazy because you look at them and their retina looks 100% normal. And then you do the OCT and you're like, oh my goodness, what was that? I didn't know that was there. So I think it's, you know, really it's almost an OCT uh, disease where it was something found on OCT, but I think it's really important. And, and I'm also fascinated whenever I get a patient with, uh, with high myopia is, is the choroidal thickness and the lack of large choroidal blood vessels that they have. And I think what is feeding the outer retina? They have they have no circulation underneath their, their RPE. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I think this case shows that really well. You can actually see the sclera really, really bright down here, and you can see that there really is no choroid. Um, so it's, you know, always, every time, I always love pointing that out as well. We're meant to do this together. <laughs> well, you know, in that same vein, talking about choroidal thickness, you know, we had mentioned this earlier with CSR, CSCR. Um, that one of the key indicators of that is the thickening of the choroid underneath the uh, the RPE or underneath the subretinal fluid that we see in here. This is kind of an odd case because this one is was a head scratcher because it doesn't present like they normally do with just subretinal fluid and that's it. There was you know a lot of hemming and hawing about well the RPE looks pretty intact. This might be subfoveal drusen and Brooks membrane seems like it's fairly intact. And then there's the obvious thickening of the choroid underneath there. And our rule of thumb that I've always used is that a chordal, you know, without actually putting a number to it or actually measuring it, I've always sort of eyeballed and said the choroid should be about as thick as the neurosensory retina. So the top of the retina down to the top of the RP should be about the thickness of the choroid, roughly. Um, so it's real obvious when it does something like this, you know, where you've got this uh, increased, uh, increased permeability of the choroidal vasculature because of this um, CSR going on or the cause of it that you get this sort of thickening backlog of all of this fluid in there. And it's fun to watch these patients, if they're treated or if they're self-resolved, which a lot of them are, um, it's pretty self-limiting. It actually goes back to normal again, which is really fascinating. And, and we don't have a slide of this up here. We weren't going to talk about it, but the same holds true with the patients that we see with uveitis. So if we get a patient that, that has uh, acute uveitis and they come in, they tend to have very thick choroids. And we can see that change as they're being treated and as they're, um, uh, as they're resolving that. So it's kind of fascinating to watch. Um, but again, this patient you know, had the standard uh, uh, late sort of leakage going on, nothing early on. So we knew there was not a choroidal source to any of this leakage, not any of vascularization. We did an OCTA, and you can see there's some atrophic spots here and there, but there's no active knee vascularization in here. Um, so just uh, again, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a classic case of CSR when you look at the OCT. But you know, with all the multimodal imaging that you you can use for this, you can kind of piece it apart and see what's going on with it. Yeah, I actually when I teach the students about CSR. Um, we always, I make them memorize the typical choroidal thickness because I think it is really oh. important because right now there's actually not a standard tool to be able to measure it on the OCTs. So subfoveal, the choroidal thickness should be about 270 microns. So if you kind of keep that number in the back of your head and, and then again, in your uveitis patients or anyone you're suspecting um, central serous, you know, do an enhanced depth image of the choroid and, and grab that measurement. It's definitely very helpful. Makes, makes me feel better when I see that thickening. You know, it kind of all comes together. And I think that that's another key thing for your imagers is show them where that EDI button is. <laughs> so check on the EDI, um, especially patients, with, even patients with exudative AMD and, and, and anything that's choroidal in nature, choroidal, uh, has a choroidal source to it. EDI really is tremendous to be able to, to really bring that out and show you much more detail back there. Yeah, definitely. So now probably one of the most common things that we see is our diabetic patients. And there's so much that we can learn about from the OCT images. Um, so just wanted to show a couple examples of you know, our typical findings in our diabetic patients. One is that we typically get exudation in the uh, outer plexiform layer. And so you can see these little hyper-reflective spots. You know, luckily, exudation always goes in the same area. And so it's really nice. I, I always like that when we're looking at a patient. We can say, oh, that's probably exudation um, when you're just looking at the OCT images and then you look at the clinical and you've definitely confirmed it. 
Um, we can definitely have lots of cotton wool spots. Those are going to appear in the nerve fiber layer. And you'll see, again, a hyper-reflectiveness in the inner retina um, up in the nerve fiber layer. And, and these are great because you can actually monitor them over time and see if we have changes to them. Um, and I think it's also important to, when you note them, to remember that if it's a very large and kind of hefty cotton wool spot, we can actually end up with some nerve fiber layer atrophy down the road too. So I think it's, they are important to document and really understand where they are. Um, the next image is, is a vitreous hemorrhage that's associated with diabetes. And so, you know, I, I really like this image. It makes me happy to see, you can see all of the little red blood cells sitting in the, the you know, in the posterior hyoid between the posterior hyoid and the retina. Um, so this patient had a really large keel-shaped hemorrhage, just inferior to all of this. Um, but it is just another finding. And, you know, sometimes I don't, I don't necessarily, I didn't used to always pay attention to the space, you know, just kind of like looked only at the retina, but it's really important to look at the entire picture when we're taking a look at the patients. Um, and then the other thing is, is I'm sure all of you can relate that a lot of the times our diabetic patients or any of our patients are very bad historians and they'll tell you that they had LASIK for something and you look in the back of the eye and you're like, I don't, well, first of all, I don't think you had LASIK because you're still a minus five. Um, but second, um, I think you had laser for diabetic macular edema. Um, and so what you can actually find is you'll see this, you know, the, this disruption in the outer retina, that's a very typical sign of focal laser. So I, you know, I like it when things pull together. I actually have a mechanical engineering degree and I'm very anal and like things to all make sense. So when I see something like this, I'm like, okay, that laser that you have is actually for a different condition. So, so can I ask a quick question about that, Jennifer, yeah, before, you, I'm sure. sorry, before you change that slide? You said something interesting about, which I think um, a lot of people don't realize, is, is the effect that, that large cotton wool spots can have on nerve fiber layer. So if you have a very large cotton wool spot and it goes away, do you do any nerve fiber layer analysis after that? Um, you know, saying that I probably should do it more often because I think it, you know, I, I guess one of my biggest things is we always want to make sure we're treating patients for the condition that they have. And so you would hate to treat someone for glaucoma because it will mimic a glaucoma change if they have something else. And so, you know, I, I, I definitely have done, um, OCTs of the nerve fiber layer on patients, but it's something that I probably should add more into my day-to-day -day practice. Okay. Um, just to, just monitoring, you know, grab it, you know, on the day that we see it, you know, obviously from an imaging perspective, and I, I'm sure you can relate to this, um, you, you don't want to do too many images because it, right. it takes a lot of time. But I do think it is, is worthwhile, especially if you notice something that you're worried about, or especially if it is a glaucoma suspect already, they have kind of borderline IOPs. Let, let's grab it and just make sure we know what it, where exactly that defect could have come from. Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, the the classification of diabetic macular edema or CSME really shifted, um, and I think that that's an important part to talk about here. So, um, and it really utilizes the OCT instead of using our clinical exam. Obviously, our clinical exam is still extremely, extremely important, but we're you know going to use the OCT to debate really who needs treatment and who doesn't. Um, and I think that that's really, really important. So, um, it still utilize the ETDRS circles, which we can see here. And so, anytime you're looking at a diabetic patient and you're looking at their edema, I think it's really important to look at the ETDRS circles. Um, but the new classification uh, classifies anything within this larger or the middle sized circle as diabetic macular edema. And if it's within the center circle, that would be considered center-involved macular edema. So we, we don't necessarily need to send patients who have inferior uh, edema that's just in this quadrant for treatment, especially if it's not affecting the vision, but we might want to refer someone for treatment or monitor closer if that edema was superiorly, because obviously gravity can help pull that down into the fovea. But if we have anything in that center uh, sub uh, center circle, those are patients that really should be sent for you know an avastin injection or, or some sort of uh, treatment for their macular edema at that point. Um, so we have two cases here where we both have center-involved diabetic macular edema. This one on the top is much more subtle, but you can see that we have this little cystic space right in the fovea. Um, and the one on the bottom is obviously much more severe, and I don't think anyone would question that this one needs treatment. But I think by using the ETR circles, we can actually start to pay a little bit closer attention and, and get our patient's management a little bit quicker. 
And then here I've got a patient um, who developed a neovascular membrane. And, and this was actually, uh, this is my favorite little neovascular membrane that I've found on the OCT and geography. Um, and I think it's really important just to take a step. I know um, probably not everyone has OCT and geography, but what's, what's really lovely about it is if we really start to understand the etiology of the disease, we can see what we can understand what we need to look for and really learn about our patients. But we can also start to pick, it, pick up changes even on our regular OCTs without having the angiography when you really understand the difference. And I think that's really what I want, want everyone to kind of realize is understand the pathophysiology of the disease and you'll be able to pick it up even without the angiography. So typically in our diabetic patients, we will end up with um, microaneurysms that are going to occur in the deeper layers of the retina. And so you can see all of these little pinpoint uh, dilatations. These are all um, uh, microaneurysms. And so these are really early to pick up even very subtly in your early diet, like even before you see hemorrhaging and you see, you know, early diabetics, you'll be able to pick up these microaneurysms. Um, also the capillary dropout is going to be really important for managing these patients because we want to look at the foveolar vascular zone. That's kind of one of my, my first spots that I look and it should be about of a third of the disc diameter. And you can see in this patient that it's actually increased a little bit. So this is showing us that the patient has some macular ischemia. And when we have macular ischemia, what you'll notice, especially on your thickness plots and everything, is the retinal thickness is a little bit thinner than normal. And so that is that it could be associated with a decrease in acuity. And I think that that's really important. Sometimes these diabetics, you're like, why are they not 2020? And they're like a, a poor 2025. 2040, it's because they have some drop out of the capillary bed there. And I think that that's a really important way to differentiate and kind of just to understand and feel better about our patients. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is if we look at this, you know, I actually caught this neovascular membrane before we did the angiography, because if we look at this top image up here, you can actually see that there's a little bit of fibrotic tissue right overlying. And so this, this neovascular membrane is really kind of tugged in tight to the retina still, but we can see that fibrosis. And we know that our neovascular membranes always come with some scaffolding to try and keep them safe. And so we can pick that up even without having the floor, or without having a fluorescein angiography, without having a, a uh, OCT angiography. But when we do have the OCT angiography, really can visualize that beautiful net. And then even on the, um, de when you look at the decorrelation signals, we can see that there's actually a lot of increased flow in that area. So the decorrelation signal is looking at the same image in space over time. And it's looking, it's going to show you anywhere that there's movement. That movement is actually the red blood cells moving through the retina or the neovascular membrane in this case. So we can actually see that, that, that is, this is a membrane it has flow in it because we we obviously know that we're imaging right through this scan. So utilizing the imaging is really important because we're able to pick up um, where we have a membrane and we, we can know exactly where to monitor, but working really closely with your imagers is going to be extremely, extremely important to make sure you're imaging through the right spot and know that you're through that neovascular membrane in these cases. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good pickup there as well, because if you look at the, the just the standard B-scan OCT, it almost looks like there's maybe an epiretinal membrane forming or something, you know, without really sort of digging deep into that to look at that. One of the things I, this is not obviously a talk about OCT and geography, but one of the things I, I do want to point out too, is there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of, of study into uh, parafoveal capillary dropout in diabetics before there's any other sign of diabetic retinopathy, early, early signs of that. Part of the issue we have with spectro domain OCTA, though, is that, you know, we're looking, it's not a dynamic test. We're not looking, we're looking at static images of a dynamic image, if you will. So mm -hmm. if you have very tiny capillaries that are only pushing through a red blood cell every, you know, half a second or so, that OCTA may not have caught it in one scan, but they may catch it in the next one. So we do a lot of high magnification OCT angiography of the fovea for that reason, but we do multiple scans over five minutes or so just to see if there's any change within that. Um, and technically, you know, we, we, I've always thought, I, we've always felt that you really can't say that something is not perfusing on OCTA. You could say it's in, impaired perfusion, but um, you know, unless you do serial OCT angiography, you don't really know if it did change or not over that. That's why I think fluorescent angiography is still really important, obviously. Um, but but again, OCTA and diabetic retinopathy, diabetic patients, has just changed how we practice. It's, it's just incredibly uh, uh, illustrative of all the different disease pathologies you can see on these patients. Definitely. And I included our, our, well, our fundus camera is not the best right now, but I included the actual fluorescein angiography on it. So you can see that we do have that little membrane. 
And unfortunately, the patient uh, had some treatment done. You can see that they had a quite a bit of laser done within the posterior pole and then got lost to follow up for a very long time. The membrane increased in size and then they have a vitreous hemorrhage. We, we can see all of these little red blood cells up there too. So, you know, I think the OCT is really helpful. Um, OCT is helpful, but I, in, in a lot of these cases, I do agree that you still need to actually perform, you know, a, a standard fluorescein um, angiography just to confirm exactly where, where the problems are lying and especially with macular ischemia, I definitely agree with that. All right, here's another case um, of looking at diabetic retinopathy over time. So this was a patient that we were monitoring. And as we kind of discussed with the uh, diabetic macular edema, um, this patient has diabetic macular edema but it's inferior and it's not uh, subfovial, but we can monitor the patient over time. We can see that there's a little bit of an increase in elevation right here. We have some exudation within the retina. Um, a year later, the patient came back and has a little bit more edema, a little bit of thickening. We decided to monitor the patient a little bit sooner. So this was a three month follow-up. And you can see that that area of edema actually started to increase. So by looking at kind of the serial change over time, we could actually pick up, you know, it's much easier to pick up the changes. There's also an analysis called the macular change analysis, which will give you the specific measurement changes in each area. Um, and I do like to use this too, especially from a patient education standpoint, um, especially if you have a patient who's very hesitant to have any treatment done. I think that using this visualization of, look, this is where you were, you know, a year and three months ago, this is where you were three months ago, this is where you are today. It's very helpful for them to see like, oh, this got thicker. Um, and I think people really, really enjoy or really kind of buy into the, the necessity necessity of treatment at that point. And I think patient education, especially in diabetics, is, is key because they've got to be a part of that care. They've got to be mm -hmm. an active participant. And so if you can show them that this is actually getting better or that's changing, that then they can, they can it kind of clicks and they go, oh yeah, I have to really pay attention to my blood pressure, watch my A1C but better, you know, maybe make some changes. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to jump in and talk about macular telangiectasia or MACTEL. Uh, I didn't realize how much MACTEL we saw until we started doing OCT angiography five years ago in our practice. Um, we saw a lot of patients that came in, and typically the, the typical patients that are referred for, for macular edema. And you kind of scratch your head and go, okay, they're not a diabetic. Um, they're not a post-op, so maybe not a CME. And then you do an OCT scan like this, and this is a left eye horizontal scan. And you can see all of this intraretinal fluid is on the temporal side of the fovea. So even with that alone, uh, most people can kind of figure out pretty quickly this is probably MACTEL. And if you look at the fluorescein angiogram, you can see that there's these sort of small aneurysmal changes in here. There's a little bit of that capillary non-perfusion around the center. And then on OCTA, you can clearly see these same uh, uh, microaneurysms on here. Um, so these patients are, are difficult because there really is no, there, there's no treatment at this time for it. We can't give them anti-VEGF because it's not indicated for that. Um, and it really doesn't do much. It may, their edema may go away, but it doesn't solve their MACTEL problem. The edema comes back, that sort of thing. A lot of times we watch these patients because these are the patients that will actually develop retinal angiomatous proliferation. So they will have these, this sort of capillary non-perfusion here that will drop out in these, these aneurysms. And then suddenly you see a vessel make sort of a right-hand turn and start diving down through the neurocentric retina, um, which is something I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so I have several cases where patients have MACTEL, we follow them, and they develop uh, neovascularization under the retina um, because of this MACTEL leading to a rap lesion, leading to a, a proliferation of the retinal blood vessels. Yeah, really interesting. I always just love when you actually have a fluorescein angiography and the OCT angiography next to each other and how they just really do mimic each other. And this is a really great presentation of that. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about, and I'm not plugging OCTA again, but uh, actually I am, but the nice thing about OCT angiography is this fluorescein is great in this very early part of the angiogram, but after this, it just, it, the leaking just obliterates the actual size of those microaneurysms. All you see is sort of a white blob get bigger, but because OCTA doesn't show leakage, it never changes. You can actually see the exact size of these. So it's really, and, and that holds true for neovascularization as well. Here's another case as well. And, you know, earlier you were talking about vitro retinal diseases, and I meant to chime in and say, we have several different um, OCT systems in our practice. And if I wanted to highlight an entire retinal uh, scan with some great vitreous scans as well, like in this case, if I really want to show this PVD along with the entire retina, um, I go straight to, my, to Zeiss for this because it does illustrate it much better. I mean, 
there's so much going on in this. And you can see they've got a PVD, but their posterior hyaluid is still attached here. They've got mm -hmm. intraretinal fluid here. Now this isn't doesn't isn't that sort of typical sitting on the temporal side of the fovea like we, we we're used to seeing in some of these patients. But you can see on on OCT clearly large cysts and smaller cystic areas around it as well, all in the neurocentric intraretinal tissue. So you know right away we know okay this has nothing to do with any sort of cardiovascular disease obviously. But our OCT, uh, our fluorescein angiogram shows those, illustrates those microaneurysmal changes. And then the superficial vasculature of the OCT is interesting because you can see these sort of pruning of the, of the parafovia capillaries and the sort of dropout around here. But I always find when I go to, and again, I don't mean to keep going out of OCTA, but when I go to the deep retinal plexus, it looks like a bomb went off. It affects the deep retinal plexus vasculature so much more so than the superficial vasculature. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see the deep retinal plexus here, there's a larger area of, of impaired perfusion, if you will, and then these little microaneurysmal changes out here. But, um, but you know, this patient was not a diabetic. They had no reason to have retinal edema and they had it in one eye, so macular edema. So right away, we started leaning towards that. Even before we saw the patient, you know, we, we, we look at our list and say, patient referred for, macular edema right eye and you look at their history and they're pretty healthy you think it's probably going to be MACTEL. So this is my this is a zebra case this actually flows right into what we were just talking about so this patient presented and this is their OCT and so immediately um, immediately I, I start looking at this and thinking okay given the age and everything like this this is wet and AMD but then I looked at this and thought well it follows that course where the RPE is very disrupted here, and there's some subretinal fluid here, but there's also intraretinal fluid as well, which made me kind of scratch my head, not in this particular case, but when I first started noticing this. And I thought, well, that's odd. Why? I, I don't really see any proliferation of the neovascular complex from the choroid breaking through into the neurocentric retina, which certainly can happen in advanced wet AMD. We've seen these lesions grow actually right up through in through uh, in through the plexiform layers and just infiltrate the the neurosensory retina. And we've actually had seen patients that have actually broke through and bled into the vitreous. I mean, in really, really severe cases. But I didn't see that here. There's no connection there that I could really discern. So I was wondering where that came from. So we did a fluorescein angiogram on the patient. And when you look at the fluorescein angiogram, it looks like there's a subfoveal or yeah, subfoveal and neovascular complex going on here. But when you really kind of take it up, tear it apart here and start looking at this magnified, um, this this area here, if you look down here, you can kind of see that Brooks membrane is is all intact. So right there should be a, a, a flag telling you, well, if they have a neovascular complex, it had to come through Brooks membrane. It doesn't skip around Brooks membrane. It's got a that's the natural course of it. Yet here is this sort of volcanic activity of neovascularization, which corresponds to this neovascular complex. And when we look on the fluorescent, we can see this retinal blood vessel actually changes um, hue, if you will. It gets to be a less bright gray, or, or the reflectance is a little bit different because it's diving down. So it's going away from me, and it's creating this neovascular complex. OCT angiography is brilliant for this because I can just scroll right through and find that neovascular complex and then back up and see where it came from. And it came from this, this retinal vascular source right here. You can see this is that brightly reflective point. And then on the flow pattern B scan, you can definitely see it. This is this is this should not be this much activity from the neurocenter and all the way down to the choroid. That should be like that, or down, uh, sorry, uh, in, above the RPE. So this is a great example of the ra of a wrap lesion that I was talking about earlier. That sometimes MACTEL will will lead to if, uh, in in more advanced cases. Absolutely. So our rule of thumb really is great become. Imaging. Thank you. Our rule of thumb has become when we do an OCT on a patient and they have subfoveal fluid or they have a neovascular complex that you know is under the RPE and intraretinal fluid, we automatically think rap lesion. That's where we automatically go to. So we did sort of an incidental study in our in our practice, and we found that was true in about 95% of the cases. Um, so when I see this, and again, this clearly illustrates, if you follow Brooks membrane, it never it's never disrupted. Even under this volcanic activity, as I like to refer to it, follow that membrane, it never changes. It's it's a solid line underneath there. So that really is a clear indicator that this is coming from somewhere else. And it makes sense that you have intraretinal fluid because uh, neovascular membranes leak fluid, right? They, they don't have tight vascular junctions. They're abnormal blood vessels. So as it's going through the neurosensory retina, it's leaking fluid while it's passing through there. So it's natural you're going to have this intraretinal fluid along with this. And this is where it sort of broke through RPE, and now it's growing this membrane under the RPE here. Uh, and then real obvious on OCT angiography, by the way, uh, you can follow this retinal blood vessel right down, and this is the neovascular complex right here.
So I, I really enjoy imaging rap lesions. They're one of my favorite things to, uh, to actually image. Here's that same just magnified view of it. Um, and, and here's that color code, uh, uh, color depth encoded uh, OCT angiogram that shows all of the layers sort of in one and adds pseudo color to whatever depth it's at. This jumps right out at you. You can definitely see this green means that it's deeper into the retina, under the retina, neovascular complex. You can follow it right back to this retinal blood vessel here. Not as easy to see on fluorescent angiography, but uh, but definitely easy to see there. So, you know, so my rule of thumb again: interretinal fluid and subretinal sub RB fluid. I think rapid. Yeah, that's really great. All right, so the last case we're going to go into is an optic nerve case. I feel like these patients always present at the end of the day when you're busy, and we have to really differentiate if this is an urgent care patient or not. Um, so we're going to move into a case of optic nerve edema. And so this patient presented to me on a Saturday, very, very end of the day. And we're like, okay, what do we do? Is this, is this actual papal edema? Do we need to send them for an MRI and a lumbar puncture? Or can we just monitor them back shortly to see if this is optic nerve pedrusin or something else? Well, when we look at the, uh, the image, actually, you can, you can very easily tell that this is a very, very swollen optic nerve. Um, but what I love to do with these cases is actually use the radial raster over the optic nerve head so that I can get a really high definition image image of the nerve. Um, we actually know that when you have uh, optic nerve head swelling, typically it's going to start on the nasal side of the optic nerve, but sometimes it's a little variable. And so having this, these kind of clock hour images can be very useful in evaluating and looking for some subtle signs that are going to tell you that this is true papal edema. So one of the things that we want to look for is the lazy V sign on your OCT image. And so when we're looking at the image, we can see down here, we have a little bit of a detachment of the retina from the from Brooks membrane. And so that's actually the lazy V sign. So you want to see that that darkening spot right below the, the uh, nerve fiber layer and below the retina. Um, that, so that's a really good indicator that there is edema there. But also what, what can be important is to look at the shape of Brooks membrane. And so typically, Typically, when we're looking at patients, a glaucoma patient, or anyone where you're taking a picture of the optic nerve head, you'll see that Brooks membrane actually has a little bit of a, 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 a curve toward the optic nerve, kind of back toward the brain. Um, in this case, we can see that it actually is curving more inward toward the eye. And that's because of the increased intracranial pressure pushing Brooks membrane forward. And so that's another indicator that this patient likely has an increase in intracranial pressure. So, you know, right off the bat, I've got this beautiful, I've got one OCT image, and I know that this patient needs to go to the emergency room. And I think that that's really helpful, especially in those cases where you're wavering a little bit. Um, I do think it's important to do uh, a serial OCT images on these patients of the nerve fiber layer. Um, this image here, we had 156 micron thickness. She came back to us two days later and it was a little bit thinner. Um, so there's a lot of fluctuation in the nerve fiber layer where when we have other conditions, such as optic nerve head drusen, we'll have a lot more stability in those thickness numbers over time. But I also think that doing the serial imaging can be really helpful for learning when we've actually had resolution of the edema. So in this case, we image the patient multiple times. We can see that we actually have a loss of, of that thickness over time, this would be considered a significant change, and then we have even more significant change over time. So it's really great way to really you know, look for that resolution. So here's another image of her, the actual um, typical serous images that we'll see. Here you can pick up even easier. We've got kind of that lazy V sign. You can see it very typically. You see just all of that massive edema. Um, and I think it's really, you know, really apparent when you see these, these vast thicknesses, these numbers up in the, you know, almost 400, 425 range, the, the big variability in those numbers really tells you that this is a true edema versus something that's, you know, just potentially optic nerve head drusen. Um, you know, I think also it's really important to get OCTs on these patients or get um, OCTs, but also to get a visual field on the patients to monitor for any changes. And so in this case, when we run the, um, the OCT over time, when we actually had the resolution, we can actually see that there's a little bit of inferior thinning of the nerve fiber layer. Um, in both eyes. And so when we run the visual fields, I, you know, this one spot up here, I wouldn't consider a significant defect, but we have this defect superiorly in the left eye that we have to definitely be monitoring. So it's just kind of a tip, use all of the tools in your box to make sure that we're not missing any changes over time with the patient.
So here is another patient uh, that we can look at that actually is kind of similar. So this is, or similar, but different. So this is a patient with optic nerve hydrazine. And so we can see when we're looking at this, we talked about that, that shape of Brooks membrane. And I think this is actually a really nice one to visualize it on. You can see that it actually goes a little bit posterior. Um, and so when we see that change, we, we now know, okay, we're not necessarily as worried about this. You know, we want to monitor, um, obviously go through signs and symptoms of headaches and, and you know, loss of, of sensation and all of the things you would ask about with capital edema. But in a case where we see this kind of backward movement, um, we, can, we can much more assume that this is something more stable. Um, in this case, when we have our optic nerve headed um, drusen, we know that they can actually cause compression of the retinal nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cells are on the ganglion cells and we can have nerve fiber layer atrophy. And so in this patient, we actually have superior um, RNFL loss, which is good to monitor. And we can see that that stability, we talked about the stability is a really important thing when our, with our papilledema patients, we get some fluctuation when it's actually from increased intracranial pressure, where when we have a patient who has Drusen, we really should have more stability over time. And we can see that when we look at the progression analysis for this patient. Are you doing any autofluorescent imaging on these patients to differentiate drusen? Yeah, so I, I really like to do autofluorescent images. Unfortunately, I just didn't have an, an autofluorescent image on her. I was, like, okay. I was going through the chart and I was hoping that I did, um, but we didn't have it because I think that they're they're really beautiful. And, and actually, when we do we do a lot of autofluorescence. Whenever we do a fundus photo, we typically take an autofluorescence too, because you will be surprised at the yeah. number of diseases you find when you have uh, fundus autofluorescence. And so, you know, even last week, I, we were looking at some peripheral thing and I was like, oh, the patient has drusen. And it's, it's really a great way to pick it up. Really great way there. So, and then this is just the, the another image. And I think you can kind of see the difference between when we look at the RNFL profile of this patient with the optic nerve head drusen, she's still within the green, even though we kind of have those heaped up borders that we saw in the, the actual raster scan through the nerve. But we also can see that the, you can see kind of the heaped up, it does look heaped up. It's just definitely a different heaped up than we see um, on our papilledema patient. Um, but we can also see here that her optic nerve head size is so small. So we can see these are very, very, very tiny nerves, which goes into, you know, really kind of correlates with your patients with optic nerve head drusen. Um, again, visual fields are really important because when we have nerve fiber layer thinning, which we do, in this case, she actually has bilateral superior optic nerve head thinning, um, we can actually get these visual field defects that can be mimicking glaucoma. Um, and I think always it's, it's really important to me to make sure, as we mentioned earlier, that we're always treating the proper disease. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're not treating a patient for a glaucomatous process when they have another process. That was it. Hope you guys enjoyed the lecture and learned a little bit about how to use your OCT more effectively. I think we learned a couple of things here. I, at least I did that, you know, you have to use more than just an OCT, obviously. And, and I think my, my key take home would be communication with your imagers and just making sure that everybody's on the same page and everybody's, uh, you know, looking out for the patient, obviously, but, but getting the images that you need to make the right diagnosis. Oh, I definitely agree. I'm always drawing my imagers pictures. I'm like, there's this thing right and, here. And, and I we think love it's really that. Helpful. We love that. Yes, it's right here. Yes. <laughs> Very helpful. Thank you. Great. Thank you.